Hey everyone, welcome back to another Pushing Film video where I'm going to go over my workflow for scanning film at home with a DSLR. I did an introductory video on this topic some time ago, but I've had a lot of questions since then and requests to do an updated video. And because there were a few questions where people wanted to see the whole workflow from the beginning till the end. And a lot of that involves the struggle a lot of people have with trying to get good colors when batch scanning films, when doing entire uncut rolls, whether it's 35mm or 120 and I'm gonna show you how I do it. Now keep in mind, this is just my process. A lot of this might change down the track, might not work for you, but it's what has been working for me so far. So just keep that disclaimer in mind as we go along. So for this demonstration, I am gonna be using the Essential Film Holder, which I have done a long video on before, an extensive review, so you can check that out if you want for a full breakdown of how this product works. And I am gonna be using Adobe Lightroom with Negative Lab Pro. The latest version that I'm currently using is version 2.2, as well as my Canon DSLR, which is normally the 5D Mark IV, which I'm actually filming on right now, but I've got the 6D here just for demonstration purposes. And the lens I use is a 100mm f2.8 macro lens. And the way I have my camera mounted at the moment is just on this tripod. You can use a copy stand. I am hoping to maybe get a copy stand down the track, but this has been serving me well so far. It does take a little bit more time to set up. What I've done is just drawn some lines on the legs to at least give me a good starting point as to where I have the height for scanning 35 mil in this case. The light I use is still this Viltrox uh, L116T that I mentioned in my essential film holder review. It works quite well in this scenario. The uh, essential film holder will diffuse the light, but basically you want something with a high CRI of 95 or above, which will uh, fit your film holder. So again, I am using the essential film holder for this demonstration, but you can use whatever film holder you like. Just keep in mind with this case, the diffuser will be required to get a nice soft light out of a, a light source like this. If you're using one of the Kaiser Slim lights or something like a tracing pad, uh, you can get away without using a diffuser. But uh, if you are using generic video lights like this, I do recommend the Essential Film Holder uh, or something similar with a good diffuser to make sure you're getting as soft a light as possible. And what you'll notice I've done with this light is I've masked off the area of the light that's not required so that when I have the Essential Film Holder uh, sitting over it, there's no stray light coming off from the edges there. And the um, second purpose that this serves quite well is that it stops the Essential Film Holder uh, from moving around on the light. So what I've done is masked off with gaffer tape a perimeter so that the four legs on the essential film holder here uh, sit perfectly within that so that when it's sitting on there, it's not moving around. So I can have that sitting on the light and it's not really going to move around on the light itself. So I use the um, Viltrox light here at 100% power with 5600K daylight balance. And another question I get quite often is because this light has uh, a knob on the back of it and that it wouldn't really sit perfectly flat on the table. Uh, a lot of people ask me this in the comments, but what I do is I just put the battery in, I power it through a battery or you can use a dummy battery, but then it will sit uh, perfectly flat on your surface with that battery clipped in there. So keep that in mind for any similar lights which have those knobs. Sometimes with the battery uh, clipped on, you will get a surface that you can just lay it on flat. Now one thing also is that with the light sitting on the battery like that, the light can sort of move around the table and slip around. I have a very simple solution to that is I've just attached this included sort of hot shoe bracket that came with the light and I've just stuck a little bit of blue tack on the little ring there. And when I put that light down on the table underneath my camera to scan, I just push that down onto the table and that stops it from swiveling around. So when I have the essential film holder uh, sitting on top of that and it's just laid flat, the little knocks won't cause this to move around and it can just sort of be steady enough for me to scan entire uncut rolls without having to worry about moving things around and each frame will be in the same spot within that perimeter on the light. So that's my solution for the Viltrox L116T light. That's what I've been using for a while. I might upgrade sometime down the track. If I had spent a little bit more money, I probably would have preferred to have gotten the Relino light with the built-in rechargeable battery, which also has a completely flat back. 
I will link that in the description of the video and hopefully sometime down the track I might upgrade to that light and um, give you any thoughts or findings on any potential differences. But uh, yeah, this is what I've been using so far. I would recommend maybe going with something like the Relino if you can um, justify that slight extra cost. So the next thing, going back to my uh, camera and macro lens setup, you don't have to use a macro lens, but to be honest, that is going to be the best result as opposed to using something like an extension tube or any conversion or close-up adapters. A macro lens like a 100 mil is gonna be the best uh, choice in my opinion. If you are going to use one of these modern stabilized macro lenses, turn off the in-lens stabilization. You don't want any stabilization when you're doing uh, copying or DSLR digitization of your film. It's going to introduce micro vibrations that'll soften the result. I've done some tests, at least with the case of this L-Series 100mm 2.8. Turn off the stabilization, you'll get a better result. Another thing I'd recommend is to use the included hood if you have it. Once you've set everything up and aligned it, uh, just use that hood. It'll also help with shielding from any stray light. The next thing in terms of equipment worth mentioning is that I use a remote release. So what I have here is just a wireless uh, intervalometer that I bought from Amazon and it's just a wireless system. So I don't have to have a cable tethered to risk pulling or vibrating the camera or anything like that. The camera is perfectly still. I just have the receiver attached there. So I'm just using the remote when I have my um, film scanning set up and just moving the film along and using this remote to wirelessly trigger the shutter as I scan. So in terms of the process, one of the first things you wanna do is just wipe down your entire surface with a damp cloth or sponge. This is going to help a lot with dust flying around the surface. It's going to just um, give you a good clean surface to work on as well. So that's the first thing I'd recommend doing. And the next thing you wanna do is align your camera over the film holder so that it's lying perfectly over the aperture uh, on the essential film holder in this case or whatever holder you're using and position the height so that you're filling the entire frame of your sensor with the frame of film in the holder. You can leave a tiny little bit of border if you like. When it comes to batch scanning, I would recommend not to leave too much of the border. It's going to make your life a lot easier when you're over in Lightroom trying to do the batch conversion and everything. So uh, try not to leave much of the border when you're positioning your camera, try and fill the frame. And then the next and important thing is to make sure that your alignment is good in terms of the actual uh, camera itself. So what I do is use the mirror trick that you might have seen online. You can look this up. Um, you can even check it on the essential film holder information page. But basically you wanna put the mirror over the aperture of your film holder. You're going to wanna have the lens to appear right in the middle of the reflection that you're seeing. So I'll, I'll try and show that a little bit in the B-roll here as I'm talking about it, but basically you wanna adjust the tripod or copy stand to align and level your camera so that the sensor is perfectly in the middle so that when you remove that mirror, you know that everything's level. So at this point, once you start handling film is what I'm gonna recommend that you definitely uh, use a good pair of gloves, ideally some that uh, don't give off a lot of lint. And then you're going to uh, take your uncut roll of film and uh, put it into your holder. And I recommend doing this with the emulsion side up. In my testing, that gives a slightly sharper or better result. You don't have to do this, but that's just my preference. So you're going to, in the case of the essential film holder here, just insert the film until you reach the first frame there. And then just put that over your holder and turn on the light. So I usually have the remote release in my hand, the same hand I'm usually pulling the film through as I advance one frame at a time, take a shot, advance one frame at a time and take a shot. It's usually a pretty quick process. It just takes a couple of minutes to um, photograph the entire roll. Now, one tip I have for that is to turn off the image review, which can really slow things down. If you wanna scan quickly, turn off the image review. In terms of other settings for capturing the actual frames of the negatives, I've uh, put together a little page on my website, on the blog there, that will um, help you to refer to, to figure out all the settings. There is a bit of uh, variability there in terms of how you might wanna set up your exposures, but generally you wanna use the sharpest part of the lens, use consistent settings across the entire roll, use a manual uh, exposure and white balance so it's not changing in between shots. And you just wanna expose the film so that you're filling in um, that middle portion of the histogram, that you're getting all the information nicely distributed along the histogram but you wanna ignore any extra little blips at the um, extreme ends of the histogram that are representing the black of the holder itself, for example. You can ignore those. So shoot in the full resolution your camera is capable of, use the raw capturing feature, 
And in terms of dust, I just try and keep one of these rocket blowers handy uh, just to give the film a good blow before I start scanning and a couple of intervals throughout the process. And as you're moving along, the settings shouldn't really need to change. If there are some significant differences in or underexposed or overexposed frames on that roll of film, you can adjust the shutter speed on your camera according to those frames up or down a little bit if you need to. But Generally speaking, you shouldn't really need to change it if your exposure on the film is a little bit high or low because that frame might be in fact a little bit dark or bright. So that's it, you just move through and do the entire roll. Try and keep the uh, film sort of curled up like this on the entrance and exit side to prevent it from sort of falling into places where there's a lot of dust. And then if you want, you can be uh, scanning multiple rolls. So if you've accumulated uh, quite a lot of film like I have here, you can just maybe take a blank shot every time you finish your roll. So that serves as a little divider when you're importing the images so that you know uh, when one roll has ended and the next one has started. All right, so now let's just head over to the PC and show you what I do in Lightroom with Negative Lab Pro. All right, so I'm on the import screen of Lightroom now. I'm just gonna select all those photos I just took from that roll of Portra 400 that I was just showing you for the demonstration. And I'm just gonna import those into my Lightroom library. All right, so once I've imported all these images, I'm just gonna pick any that has a good decent exposure. So it could be the first one, could be the last, doesn't really matter. But let's just take a look at this one here. I won't bother with rotating them or anything yet. So I'm just gonna take the white balance selector here and pick from any transparent uh, part of the film from the actual film base. So whether it's from the border itself or from a completely uh, unexposed area, like, you know, this would be black. So I can choose from there, but ideally from the bit of film border that I've left. And then I'm just going to apply the profile corrections for the lens just to get rid of a little bit of that lens vignette. That doesn't really matter. You don't have to do that if you don't want. And what I generally do also is uh, just sort of crop out that border. Another thing you don't really have to do, but if you want to leave the border, you can. And then I'm going to select all the other images and sync those settings across, including the white balance and the crop that I just made and synchronize that. So as you can see now, I'm going back to grid view and those settings are being synchronized across all the frames. Now, the next thing you need to do, because if you remember, we scanned with the emulsion side up. So if you did this too, if you scan emulsion side up, just go up here to the photo option and choose to flip images horizontally. This will get rid of that mirrored image that you would have resulted uh, from having scanned the emulsion side up. But if you didn't do that, you don't have to bother with this part. The next thing you might choose to do here is rotate your images. Um, I wouldn't bother doing this just yet. It's a bit easier to do once you've actually converted the negatives into positives. So I'm just gonna leave that for now and select all my images and open up Negative Lab Pro. Uh, one thing when it comes to this is that you can use the NLP hotkey that comes with the software. So you don't have to every time go up to the file uh, option, go to plugin extras and select Negative Lab Pro. You can use the hotkey by just pressing Control Alt N on Windows and that'll bring up the NLP interface that you see here on the left. So once you've got that open, you have a few options. You can choose the Frontier or Noritsu uh, simulation. I don't find there's a huge difference between the two. It defaults to Frontier, so I'll just leave it on that. Pre-saturation you can choose, so I'm not sure if default and medium are the exact same. Generally select one of those two. If you've left a bit of the border, make sure you have uh, enough of that buffer to account for the border so that you can still leave it there with the conversion. So generally 5% is a good amount if you've only left a bit of the border. And then once you've selected um, that border buffer, go ahead and convert the negatives. But I'll just skip ahead to when all these conversions are done. So we've just skipped ahead now to the conversions having been done. It's just taking a moment for them to show up there. And what you can see is that all those negatives have now shown up as positives and I've got one active frame up here in the navigator. So with the negative lab pro window, this is where we have a few options. And if you look at the overall colors here, they all look pretty good already. They look a little bit on the cold side though. And um, you might not mind that. Uh, you can mess around down here with the white balance to make some overall adjustments to warmth. And as I slide that white balance up here, you can see it being reflected in that uh, indication frame up in the window. But what you can also do is change between the different presets. You've got white balance auto neutral, which is what it defaulted to, the auto warm, which is a little bit nicer in my opinion. And then you've got the um, the Kodak. So all of these work pretty well. Um, you can even go auto cool. You can see that's gone very blue. Um, but what we're gonna do for this one is let's say go with the uh, auto warm. And we're going to also maybe bring down the brightness a little bit and the contrast. Now, mind you, you don't have to be too exact here. You can go back and readjust these later, but I just want a good overall look on the frame that I'm looking at there. I like to tick the soft high, which is gonna give me softer highlights. 
And with all that, I think I'm pretty happy to maybe sync that, that setting, all those settings across all the frames. And to do that, you just go down and click sync settings here. So because everything's selected, it's going to synchronize what I've just done there across to all the frames. And you can kind of just see there, it's a subtle adjustment where everything became a little bit warmer. And at that point, with this particular role, it's looking pretty good. So I'm gonna click apply. Mind you, you can always go back and change anything um, before going ahead and making uh, JPEG or TIFF copies. You can just click apply for now and look at what you're working with. So if we look at uh, everything there still being updated, it's overall looking pretty good. This is the point where I would probably go ahead and rotate all my images so that I can see what I'm working with a little bit better. And you can use the keyboard shortcuts uh, if you want to do this, that's what I'm just doing right now. As I click through, it's a lot quicker. And uh, once you've rotated your images, you can kind of have a better look at what you're working with. All right, so I've rotated all the images and this is uh, pretty much it. This is where you can have a look at what you've got and you can go back and make any adjustments to individual frames if you like, or maybe you might have a roll of film that's been shot across multiple different scenes. So for example, all, the, all these scenes here on the beach look pretty good to me. They're ready to convert into JPEGs, but you might also have um, scenes that uh, look a little bit different or need individual adjustment. So what I do in that scenario is just choose all those images from that one scene, go into survey view uh, by clicking N, reopen negative lab pro, and then within there, you can make an adjustment just to these photos here. So if you prefer, maybe instead of having the auto warm features for these, um, go to auto neutral, see how that looks that does look a little bit better. Maybe you can do auto neutral with a little bit of extra uh, yellow there. And maybe I'll drop the contrast even more for these images because it is a contrasty scene. I'll go ahead and click sync settings across all those four. And that's it. Once I click apply, that has only been applied to those four images that I just selected. Everything else remains the same. Maybe I could go ahead and do that um, to these ones here but it's really up to you at this point, you can make adjustments to individual scenes. But at this point, what you wanna do is select everything again. This is really uh, worthwhile. And go down uh, to Negative Lab Pro again. And when that's open, at this point, this is when you're probably ready to convert them into JPEGs, which is gonna make it a lot easier for doing any further editing. Once you've got a good working base within Negative Lab Pro, just click this Make a Copy box down there choose TIFF or JPEG, it's really up to you. I choose JPEGs just to save a bit of size and I like to add a subfolder. So once you've done that, click apply and Lightroom will make a new folder with all those images in JPEG format. While I'm waiting, you can see a little loading bar there. Lightroom is slowly populating uh, all those JPEG versions of the images into this folder. So what I'll do is just speed through this process so you can just see when they've all been copied as positives in a separate folder. All right, so that's it. All the images have been copied into JPEGs. And the big advantage of this is that when you go into the develop module, everything works as per usual. If you were editing the negative form, the CR2 in the case of Canon, um, everything would be in reverse. But now with the JPEG, you can treat it as if it was an actual film scan you got from the lab to make all your final adjustments. Whether that's just some cropping or final color adjustments, usually Following this process, I get a really good base to work with. Uh, one thing worth noting here is you can go into Negative Lab Pro in your uh, color profile section, and they include some really nice profiles that work well to complement um, DSLR scans that you've made. Some of the nice ones include the um, the Pack-On uh, simulation here, or even the, the Natural or Gamut correction, which serves to correct a bit of those weird blues and reds that you might get with certain camera scans. So I usually like to select the Negative Lab Natural profile that's included with Negative Lab Pro. Um, you can check the Negative Lab Pro instructions as to how to install those. And of course, just make any final adjustments that you'd like, treat it as you would a scan you got back from the lab with the added benefits of DSLR film scanning. When it comes to doing black and white, it's pretty much the same process once you've imported your black and white film scans, you just open up Negative Lab Pro. The only difference is that you're going to select the black and white option from the drop down here. Uh, same thing applies with everything else. You just go ahead and uh, convert the negatives first. And once you have done that, you can do the same process for the rest of it. All right, so that's it. That's my workflow for batch scanning film at home. The same will apply to doing 120 film. 
or even for black and white. Black and white's in fact a lot easier when it comes to the conversion side at least. As mentioned, you just choose the black and white option in Negative Lab Pro and it does a great job. So this process of mine might change down the track. I might upgrade or change some of this equipment, who knows, but that's what's been working and working well for me so far. So I'll generally use this process for scanning any uncut rolls of film that I've developed at home. Or even if I've uh, had film developed by the lab, I usually ask to leave it uncut so that if I do want to rescan some frames on that roll or even the entire roll for whatever reason, it makes it a lot easier. You can just batch scan it. And once I've done that and made sure I've rescanned any frames that I want to from those uncut rolls from the lab, that's when I go ahead and cut and sleeve that film for easier storage and archiving later. If you do want to use this method for scanning strips of film, you can do that. It's just obviously going to take a little bit longer. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments or even better, join the Discord server where you can have a continuous discussion in one of the channels such as the Technical Advice channel. And I know a lot of you might have more in-depth questions when it comes to topics like this. In case I didn't cover everything, I'm thinking to do a live stream and Q&A as I scan in some film for demonstration purposes in about a week from now. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel or that you check back later if you want to check out that live stream. I will leave that video on the channel in case you're watching this more than a week after it's been released. So thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful and I'll see you on the next episode of Pushing Film.